Okay, well, we're going to start here. I'm going to be teaching the first session. I'm going to be teaching on the context principles from what I started last time. And then, uh, so we'll talk about rather humanistic principles. And the first one we'll look at is the context principle. And then I'll look at the typological principle. Now, hermeneutic principles are so important. It's so important to understand how to interpret the Bible properly, because there's been so much abuse over the years of improper uh, interpretation. And even with understanding some of these principles, they still have not properly used those tools to get good, solid interpretation. So one of the most important tools that you have uh, for hermeneutics is the context principle. And the context principle um, can be seen as this. Comes from the word, the Greek word, uh, the Latin word rather, comes from the Latin word contextus. And the con means together and the textus means woven. And so we are looking at weaving all of the scripture together because the Bible always agrees with itself. And so when you look at a verse of scripture and you want to get good interpretation of it, it has to fit in with the other scriptures. It has to weave together with the other scriptures, the passage, the book, the Testament, and the, and, and, and the whole Bible together. Um, this principle is very important and emphasizes the aspect that any given verse of scripture must be interpreted in the light of its context. Now remember that a text out of context is a pretext and a pretext is a purpose or motive alleged or an appearance assumed in order to cloak the real intention or state of affairs. In other words, a lie. <laughs> it can actually become a lie rather than the truth. And we've known the phrase that was going around, especially in the United States over the past number of years, fake news, where something is taken, a journalist takes a, a, a news report and a statement out of that news report, out of the context of that news report, and says, well, this is what was said, right? And, and then it becomes not true. Same, can do the same thing with scripture. So you have to be very careful when interpreting the word that you utilize the context principle so that you're not twisting it, it's not making it say something that it isn't saying. Now there are four categories of the context of Scripture. That's the context of the passage, the context of the book of the Bible, the context of the, Old Test of the New Testament and the Old Testament, and the context of the entire Bible itself. Now, the context, when you look at it, you also have to consider who's this being written to, who's the author, that sometimes plays a role. Um, what kind of writing style is it? Is it poetry? Is it narrative? Is it, is it wisdom literature? Is it the gospel? Is it the law? Is it historical, prophetic? Is it end time literature? That often plays a big role as to how it is interpreted. And is there typology involved in this verse of scripture? Um, look at the geography, sometimes plays a role in how you interpret the scripture as well. And culture ha can play a big role in how the scripture should be interpreted. So you know, there's a number of different things. So, some so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk you through two uh, examples of interpretation. So we'll apply context in real time, real life. So we'll just show you how we go about this. One of the verses that I'd like us to look at is this one here. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We use this verse all the time and encourage one another, hey, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So let's look at the context of this verse and see if we've got it right, okay? <laughs> see, let's see if we got it right. Uh, the passage is Philippians 4. And when you look at Philippians 4, there's a theme that comes out of that. And it's the peace of the Christian life, the peace of the Christian life. 
and you break it down a little bit more there. So uh, verses one through four speaks about peace with, peace with others. Verses five through nine is peace with, peace with self. Sorry, I can't speak right now. And then thirdly, peace with circumstances, verses 10 through 19. So that's, the, that's what that passage is about. And then we look at the book of Philippians, back out a little more. So we're actually, we're, we've zoomed in on the verse, now we're zooming out to get the context. Now we're looking at the book, the book of Philippians is the book of joy and rejoicing that is independent of circumstances. Now, okay, so it's written in the New Testament, and the New Testament always has the overall theme of grace. And whenever you look at the New Testament, whenever you're interpreting a verse from the New Testament, it has to fit in somehow under grace. It has to somehow support grace, because that is the whole, all uh, overarching theme of the New Testament is grace. So we see that the focus is not on this life, but the one to come. That's what the New Testament talks about. And to be content or joyful with our lives, independent of our circumstances. Then, excuse me, looking at the Bible, the overall arching theme of the Bible is redemption. Excuse me. Now, the story of redemption has many historical occurrences where God's people go through difficult times and yet find peace and contentment in their Lord and the strength to go the, to, through those various trying seasons. And so when they experience the redemption, it's experienced after they've come through a trial. Like, for example, the children of Israel going through, crossing through the Red Sea. Right, and cutting out of slavery, going through the Red Sea uh, to the other side. Redemption here is often seen as we go through trials, get through the other side. So then by taking this all into context, when we look at this verse of Scripture, and it says there, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What does it really mean? Does it mean you can do anything you want? Because a lot of people interpret it, oh, I can, I can do anything I want. God's going to strengthen me. But in context, that's really not what it's saying. It's saying you can go through all the ordained circumstances in life, the ordained ones, and God will strengthen you for the ordained circumstances in life, the trials, the good times, the hard times, the awesome times, all those that have been ordained by the Lord, yes. So you're having troubles getting through a season in time, you can call upon the Lord and stand upon that verse. Lord, you said, promise you, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can go through the hard times. That's the context of that particular verse. Okay, so that helps us understand a little more fully. And, it, you know, and... Uh, and every now and then you can encourage one another, oh, you can do all things through Christ, right? You're taking on a new project or whatever. As long as it's ordained of the Lord and you're in the will of God, yes, absolutely. Okay, the second example that I'd like to look at tonight is more controversial, and I probably get, could get into trouble doing this, but I want to do something that's more challenging and that help you to understand how important context really is. It's this verse here. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into the transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. This is a volatile verse <laughs> uh, in the Bible. And I think that it has been interpreted incorrectly in many different ways simply because context has not been properly applied. And we'll look at it. So let's look at the passage. Let's look at the verses before in uh, verses 8 through 10 of 1 Timothy chapter 2. And it says, 
says this. <clears throat> Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modesty, and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. And so let's now we've got the setting of this, the setting preceding this verse of scripture that we're looking at. It describes how the men and the women are basically to conduct themselves in a gathering. It's a church gathering, okay? A gathering of believers to worship the Lord together. Men are to pray without wrath or dissension, without division, divisiveness. You know, they've been asked to pray for leaders. They've been asked to pray for government officials. So they're not supposed to be shaking their fists at God. Said, God, will you change that? Government party, please put this government party in. I want that party to win and that party to lose. You know, like there's this like going on. And, uh, you know, and we, God's not asked us to do that. He's asked us to pray for leaders that they get born again and saved. And to do it without dissension, but they do it without division, to do it without wrath and this anger and clamor going on inside. He wants us just to come humbly before the Lord and just say, God, work in our government so that we may live peaceable lives, right? And then, um, and, and, and send the women, he says, uh, were to present themselves in a modest way. Not like the woman who were worshiping Artemis, also known as Diana. So we're going to talk about, talk about that in, in a minute. But just so you understand that he's making a reference here to a cultural setting. Okay. That's the passage. Basically, we're talking about the gathering of the saints and how to worship and how to relate. We're also talking about um, in. Yeah. So backing up to the book of the, the, the book of First Timothy as a whole. This book was written to Timothy while he's in Ephesus. What do we know about Timothy? What's one word that describes Timothy? He's Greek. What else? When you think of Timothy. Young guy, 40 years old. <laughs> Pardon me? Godly he had a godly grandmother. <laughs> One word describes him as timid. He was very timid. He was reserved. And Paul's always saying, try to encourage him. Remember the prophecies that are over you. He says, come on, Timothy, stir yourself up. Uh, you know, you know, and, you know, be courageous. So t because Timothy's got a lot of tough things to deal with in Ephesus. And this book also deals with false doctrines that are being teaching, being taught there rather. And, um, and it also talks about uh, the, ch the church leadership qualifications as well. So there's it's worship, it's dealing with uh, the conduct, and it's dealing with church leadership qualifications, but it also has to deal with the false teaching. Now, again, the New Testament speaks, it's got, to be, it's got to be grace. That verse has to be smothered in grace. That verse also has to be smothered in redemption. And before us can really understand that. So when I read that to you, I'm going to read it again. A woman must receive, must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Now, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. You feel the, you know, the, there's, there's kind of like either a condescending tone to it, isn't there? It's like, if, if I read it that way. I don't know if it was originally intended to be that way, but that's how it comes across. It's like, boom, 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 boom. A woman's got to sit. There's this oppressive thing, right? At least it feels that way. But, it ha but if it, in order for us to interpret it, we have to apply, it has to be some, there has to be grace come from out of that. There has to be a redemptive, is this, is this message redemptive? Is this verse of scripture making everybody feel redeemed at the end of the day? Okay. Now, there's another aspect of, of context that I think we can look at that helps us. And you, can, you don't always need to apply culture, but I think culture is applicable here because when we a first reading of this verse 
doesn't really make sense to me, you know, because of just the tone, in, the tonation, the really like there's a silencing of women in the church, and there's this like kind of pushing down and not a, not a lifting up or a restoration. Okay, but let's look at this. Cultural considerations. We have to look at Artemis or Diana in Ephesus. In this city, Ephesus, and the predominantly Greek culture, there was a the Greek goddess known as Artemis or Diana. The Romans called her Diana. And this uh, goddess was worshipped more in a, a personal matter than any other god in Greek Roman time. Uh, it was the, you know how we have our personal devotionals and we're you know, spending time alone with the Lord and we're, we're worshiping him in our personal private times. Uh, Artemis was the god of choice that the Greeks would, would worship it like that. There was more of a heartstring attachment to, to her than the other gods. And so there was a real close relationship with this goddess. And this worship was based out of Ephesus in the temple of Diana. Now this temple was known as one of the seven wonders of the world at the time. It was huge, excuse me, and everyone around the world would come to visit this temple and worship because she was the god of wealth of all the businesses. And so businessmen would come, businesswomen would come, and they would worship her and, you know, obviously provide finance for her with the hope that they would be blessed in return and, uh, and have their finances kept safe as well. So for financial gain. But uh, she is also known as the goddess of fertility. And so the woman worshipped her specifically as well. And the reason why they worshipped her is because, according to mythology, her mom gave birth to her twin brother, somehow while she was still alive. But this goddess helped her mom give birth to her twin brother. And so the women worshipped her with the hopes that she would give help to them when it came to them to give birth to their babies. And so they uh, were worshipping her and showing alliance to her uh, and a loyalty to her with the hopes that indeed when, she, when they went to go have their babies that they would be protected. Keeping in mind that one in three in the ancient world, uh, pregnancies ended in the death of the mother, okay? So it was a high mortality rate. In Canada now, I think it's 10 in 100,000. Um, um, some places, some uh, countries in Africa, it can be as high as 1,000 in 100,000. So we know that, that there can be higher rates of mortality, and it seemed that in the ancient world, they were quite high, and so that's why they worshipped her. It's kind of life and death, uh, you know, mentality type of thing. This was a cult, and it was ran by the women. The women were the leaders. They, 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 they taught in a different way. Um, they used incantations and prayers. So if you wanted to learn about Artemis and the, the religion of Artemis, you would come visit and you would hear these women praying and having these incantations and they'd be learning things from, that's how they were, that's how they were learning. So it was vocal, loud, lots of activity going on. They had all kinds of celebrations that were, you know, wild, <laughs> you know, not as, as uh, uh, um, uh, should I say, uh, controlled, if you will, like we would have here. It was, it was, it was, it was uh, you know, it's the worship of a, a demon god, right? So then things aren't like we, think we have them here. <laughs> um, so it was quite crazy at times. Uh, they taught, or the t teaching of Artemis was this, was that sin, original sin, came through man and not through the woman at all. So that immediately puts them superior, right, to the man. 
So they uh, taught that. And uh, they also said this, that um, the woman was the originator of man. So do you know how in the Garden of Eden we have God creates Adam and then out of Adam comes the woman. In this story, it's the opposite. Woman is created first and then out of woman comes the man. So it's opposite. So there's opposites here. That's the Greek culture. That's the, uh, the religious teaching that's happening there. And the worshipers of Artemis express their loyalty to their God by dressing gold and pearls and braided hair. Now the braided hair uh, was very beautiful to uh, the Greek uh, culture. Uh, it was central. It was that which they used to attract you know, men to them. This uh, uh, worship was filled with uh, temple prostitution. And so they were, you know, domineering the men through their teaching, through the way they worship, through the temple prostitution, obviously getting money from the, the, from the wealthy men that would come and they would be paying, right, for the prostitution. And so... Um, as a result, that's how they, the ladies got their, their money. These priestesses were rich and powerful, and so they had authority. And, and so this is the setting that we find uh, this Timothy in. Poor Timothy. <laughs> because these ladies probably were getting born again and coming into his church. And when they come into his church, they would say, Oh, we're going to worship God like we worship Artemis. And they were praying, they're crying out, and they're doing their incantations, and they're, you know, and so they're, they're, they're noisy, and they're loud, and they're domineering, just their attitude, because they, it's what they do, that's what they know. That's what their culture is, as far as worship is concerned. So they have to learn a whole new way to worship the Lord. And so then we see, uh, this brings a whole different light to this verse of Scripture. So let's look, let's back up here. If we, with that in, in um, view, it says this. Let's read it here again. So it's with, those, with the things that we're learning here. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. In that culture setting, what he's trying to get the women to do is to learn first, right? Sit down. No, don't pray right now. No, we don't want to hear your incantations. We just want you to listen for the teaching first. Okay, so let's just hear you do it. Um, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. So because they've been doing this all along, they've been exercising the authority. They've been the leaders. They're the church leaders, you know, the worship leaders. They're, they're running the show. But now it's a whole flip around. And the guys have got to take authority and they've got to start and they're doing the teaching, so we ladies, you need to sit down and listen. Um, now, for it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. Because it's, he's trying to address their false doctrines. And then, and, uh, but the woman being deceived fell into, into the transgression. So and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into the transgression. He's saying, ladies, you had a part in this too. <laughs> you fell along with the men. And then, uh, uh, but then the woman will preserve through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity, sanctity with self-restraint. So ladies, if you worship Jesus now, you can now experience the same kind of protection and grace for childbearing. That makes a whole makes a lot of, <laughs> when you, in context, sure, certain helps to straighten that, that verse out quite a bit more. Now, but there's still a little bit of, of, of things that, uh, okay, well, yeah, but, you know, there's, you know they're, they're not supposed to exercise authority over a man, and the women shouldn't still be teaching. So, okay, well, let's look at some more context. Are there other women in the Bible that do teaching? Well, let's take a peek. Let's just look at the New Testament. Let's see if we can find some. Yeah, we'll find a few. Well, we start off with Mary Magdalene. 
Mary Magdalene is the first evangelist on planet Earth. <laughs> Jesus meets up with her, encourages her, and said, go tell the disciples, right? Go tell them. Basically, that's evangelism. That's what you're going telling the disciples, telling uh, people that Jesus is alive and well, he's risen from the dead. Also, Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila in Acts chapter 18, verses 23 to 28, they have the opportunity to teach Apollos. Apollos is a great teacher, but he's only familiar with the baptism of John. They say, they take him aside and they give him the fuller picture. <laughs> Jesus is the Messiah. He's risen from the dead. Uh, we have now a, a baptism in Christ. Oh, he gets it and he grabs a hold of it and then he becomes even more mighty in his preaching and teaching and refuting of the Jewish uh, uh, opposition. Did Priscilla teach this man? Obviously. Did she exercise authority over him? I think so, because she told them the way, a fuller way, along with her husband. They taught together. That would be one example. So uh, Phoebe is another one. Phoebe is a deacon, uh, according to Romans chapter 16, 1 through 2. And Paul recommends her and commends her. Now deacons um, is, is, is like an office, right? You've got elders, and then right under elders you have deacons. So it's a, a, a place of authority. Um, and then, of course, Philip the Evangelist has four daughters who are prophets, and they're speaking and prophesying uh, with authority as well. So the thing to note with, with whenever you look at um, portions of Scripture, you have to ask yourself, is this a corrective portion of Scripture or is this a de declarative, all right, or a narrative. Is there something corrective in here? And, and when you look at like 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 13, 14, and uh, other portions of, of Corinthians, and here in Timothy, there is a, an element of correction. So when you discern that, then you have to be careful, okay, what are we trying to do? Is, is, is there a pendulum swing? So is he swinging the pendulum? Obviously, the language is quite strong. Why? Well, because the ladies are so strong themselves, they need kind of like that, that counterbalance to help them come into, oh, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, we're going to learn how to do worship Jesus this way. He had to be firm. And, that's, and he's speaking to Timothy here. Remember, Timothy's timid. He needs a boost. Listen, you've got to be firm with these guys that are teaching false doctrines and, and mythologies and stuff like that. You can't, you know, so tell the woman to be quiet because then we want them to learn first. And then they can go and be involved um, and that kind of thing. I don't want them exercising authority at this particular point in time. Now, it could be uh, that that is just uh, localized. Others say, no, it's universal. And so we have this division in the, in, in the evangelical churches where we have, you know, women can't teach. And then others say that they can. And, uh, but that just sheds some light on there. I'm not going to go establish doctrine. That's up to the elders here. They got to figure that one out as to <laughs> uh, what women can and cannot do in the church. But I'm just shedding light <laughs> through the context principle. And then the other principle is the typical principle is a really a beautiful principle. It is the principle that is used to help interpret scripture by recognizing the essence of types in the word of God and applying proper guidelines to their use in interpreting scripture. Now, we're going to go right to the verses of scripture where we see the word type, as that'll get us right there. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who is to come. So Adam's a type of Jesus. Then also he considered um, that God is able to raise people even from the dead from which he also received him back as a type. So what's type? In the Greek, the word type, the first one is tupas. It's a person or thing prefiguring a future messianic person or thing. It's a person or thing prefiguring a future messianic person or thing. Second Greek word where we find this is the parabole. I don't know if I said that right, but it's something like that. It's a placing of one thing 
by the side of another. Juxtaposition, an example by which a doctrine or precept is illustrated. So types illustrate doctrine. So for example, I'll give you one rule off the bat, is the sacrificial lamb. The Passover sacrificial lamb, it's a type of Christ in that it's without spot or wrinkle. You know, it was, it, you know, it was innocent, all these number of things. The blood was shed uh, for the forgiveness of sins. That's a type. So all, all those thousands of maybe millions upon millions of sacrifices all foreshadowed were type of the, of the ultimate sacrifice to be done, excuse me, at the cross. Okay, so in conclusion, a little bit more of a definition, let's conclude. A type is basically something that prefigures something else. A type is also an illustration, a historical event or person ordained by God, which effectively prefigures some truth connected with Christianity. And so it has to be an institution like the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, a historical event like the crossing over from the Red, through the Red Sea, uh, can be a person like Joseph, we'll look at it in a minute, who's ordained by God, uh, which effectively prefigures some truth connected with Christianity. I'm going to give you some characteristics of a type and then we'll finish off with an example. The type must be real and have a meaningful uh, and it must rather have, and have meaning in its own right. It must be real and have meaning in its own right. There must be evidence that the person, event, or institution actually existed and functioned in a real time period with a distinctive meaning. So for example, again, looking at the sacrificial lamb, the priest would just be sacrificing that over and over and over and over and over again, not even thinking of what was actually, it was prefiguring. They would just, this is how we deal with sins today. And, and so it's actually happening, God in his sovereignty is saying, no, this is a fantastic picture of what I'm going to be doing with my own son, right? Also the example of Isaac being offered uh, as by, from, by uh, his dad, ready to slay him. And it was a fantastic picture of what is going to happen. Did Abraham know, had no idea that this was going to be a prefigure of the, the coming son who would be sacrificed for the, all the sins of the world. And there must be a divine intention to have con connected the type with the antitypes. There has to be a divine intention to have connected the type with the antitypes. So there is, a, there is a connection between the two, but it's ordained, excuse me, by God. And it becomes very clear and evident. So let's look at a real quick example. We're going to look at Joseph in the Old Testament. How he's, you know, we put Joseph's life alongside Jesus' life, and then we see the parallels. Both firstborn. Both were beloved of their fathers. Both sent to their brothers by their fathers. Both were given up as dead by their fathers. Both received back to their fathers from the grave, figured for Jacob, but in reality for God the Father. Both rejected by their brethren. Both sold for silver. Both severely tempted. Both suffer as criminals. Um, Joseph becomes the world's bread supplier. And Jesus becomes the world's bread supplier of life. Uh, a bread of life supplier, both exalted to the throne, both receive a Gentile bride, both reconcile with their brothers, and both have all bowed the knee to them. <laughs> it's just like 14 parallels like that. You can't create that. Like, there's only one who can do that. And that's God set that whole thing up. And there's types like this throughout the Old Testament and they just are, it's just mind-blowing when you look at this. God has set this thing up from the beginning, before the beginning. <laughs> he's had it all planned out. And the interesting thing is, is that he took Joseph's life and all of Joseph's mistakes, he wove them in. All of Joseph's right decisions, he wove them in. And that's how he does it with our lives. He takes our lives and all of our mistakes and all the good things we do, and he weaves it all together and turns it all in out for good. 
because the Bible says all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. We see this in types. Um, and the type must be, uh, uh, have a purpose and be effective in its own time frame. And the type must be a prophetic of Christ or some facet of Christian truth. So that's just the principle of context and types in those two, put those two together and you've got a good armory for interpreting scripture correctly.